Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brad Thompson, and I am the Executive Director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism, and I would like to welcome all of you here uh, for our Pope Lecture for this semester. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Pope Foundation in North Carolina for their very generous support of today's lecture. Now to our main event. Our speaker today, Dr. Yaron Brook, is a world-renowned public speaker. As you'll see from his extraordinary CV, he has accomplished a, a great deal uh, in his lifetime. He is the host of the nationally syndicated Yaron Brook Show. His radical capitalist series can be heard on Blog Talk Radio and YouTube. Dr. Brooke was formerly the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute for 17 years, where he remains the chairman of the board and its primary intellectual spokesman. Yaron Brooke was raised in Israel, where he served in the uh, Israeli military intelligence. He has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Israel, and he has a PhD in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. In 1998, he co-founded BH Equity, uh, BH Equity Research, uh, a research equity firm and hedge fund, uh, and he is currently a director uh, at BH Equity. Dr. Brooke is a regular col columnist at Forbes.com, and his articles have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Investors Business Daily. He is also a frequent contributor on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC. Last year alone, Dr. Brook delivered over 100 lectures around the world, speaking on topics such as the causes of the financial crisis, the morality of capitalism, ending the growth of the state, and American foreign policy. Dr. Brook, uh, over the course of the last number of years, has published several books. His most recent book is In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality, <coughs> Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government, and finally my favorite of all of his books, which he co-authored with me, <laughs> Neoconservatism, an Obituary for an Idea. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I introduce my dear friend, Dr. Yaron Brook. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here back at Clemson. Uh, I've been coming to Clemson for, uh, I don't know, it's been 15 years now, I think, uh, on and off, uh, at least once a year, usually twice a year. And uh, it's, always, it's always fun and it's always good to be here. Capitalism versus socialism. Wow. I mean, every time I'm asked to speak about this topic, I wonder, what do we have to do to make this topic go away? Because it's getting a little boring. The fact is that the debate, capitalism versus socialism, should have been over decades ago. The evidence of one versus the other is overwhelming. It's not even close. So the real question which we will get to today is why are we still having this debate? Why is this still being discussed? Why is socialism still an option? Because look, we have two systems, two systems, social systems, economic systems. They've both been tried to some extent. Now I know the socialists among you are going to say we've never really tried socialism. And I know that the capitalists among you are also going to say we know that we've never really tried capitalism. And to some extent both are true. We've never really tried capitalism. 
I would argue we've tried socialism, but okay, I'm willing to even grant you we've never really tried your particular mythological view of what socialism could be. But this, I would argue, we've done lots of variations of socialism and we've done some variations of capitalism. We've done, we've gotten really close to what ideal socialism is. We've got really close to what ideal capitalism is and the results are in. And we know what each system results in. We've done a lot of mixtures of the two. And it's interesting to study the mixtures as well. So before we get to what those results are, let's think for a minute about what each system actually is. What is socialism and what is capitalism? What do we mean when we say these terms? Because they're easily thrown out there and used. Socialism basically is a system in which the state owns the means of production, in which private property is minimized, if not completely eliminated. The group, the collective, but the state at the end of the day, is the owner of the assets in the country. No hands yet. You'll have plenty of time to ask questions, I promise. I relish them. And I'm glad to see some socialists in the audience, so uh, it makes my day. Socialism essentially is a form of statism where the state or the group or the collective supersedes the individual and manages, in quotes, the productive capabilities of a society. Capitalism is a system of individual property rights. It's a system in which the only job of government is to protect rights, primarily property rights, where the job of government is limited to only protecting those rights and otherwise leaving people free, individuals free. Those are two systems. State owns everything, runs everything. The individual is left alone. The state basically protects him and leaves him alone otherwise. Those are the two options that we have on the table. Socialism, state owns everything, or the group owns everything if you don't like the word state. Second option, individuals. All property is privately owned. State is there just to protect those property rights, just to protect your freedom as an individual. Okay, so let's take a sampling of history. Let's take a sampling of countries, of states, of economies that have functioned based on socialist ideas, and a sampling of countries, states that have functioned, generally speaking, based on capitalist ideas. And what do we get? Well, we certainly tried for 70-something years what's called communism, right? Uh, you could argue uh, an extreme form of socialism where the state really owns everything. And communism's history is pretty bleak. probably somewhere between 100 to 200 million people died under communism because they were slaughtered, because they were starved, because the system just didn't produce enough food for them to eat. Under Stalin, tens of millions of people died. Again, partially because he just killed them, slaughtered them, and partially because he let them starve purposefully in order to eradicate certain groups he didn't like, or in order to establish communal farming. Communal farming everywhere, and everywhere it's tried leads to disaster. And it was tried in the Soviet Union and led to disaster in the Soviet Union. A different form of communism, some would say, was tried by Mao Zedong in China. And there, the numbers are very similar to the numbers produced by the Soviet Union. Somewhere between 40 to 100 million people were murdered, killed, starved. During the rule, do you hear that? Or is that just me? It's it, oh, it's getting worse. All right. It's I'm yelling. All right. 
Communism's history is a history of death and destruction, of poverty, of misery. And I know for your generation, you have to tell people sometimes, you know, the Berlin Wall was built not to prevent Westerners from escaping to communism, but because communists wanted to run away from Eastern Europe to the West and need to be shot in order to stop them from doing that. Eastern Europe would have been emptied out if not for the Berlin Wall and the fences and walls that went out all over the border between East and West and Germany. Communism, as practiced everywhere, has led to nothing but blood, suffering, poverty. Soviet Union, in China, in some ways even worse in Cambodia, where in the killing fields of Cambodia, 40% of the population was murdered in the name of equality, in the name of socialism, in the name of making us all the same, in the name of eradicating private property, eradicating differences, eradicating so-called classes. The history of socialism and communism is the history of bloodshed, murder, and destruction. And knowing these facts, it is stunning that we still have socialists around. Now, that is one variation, you would say. But every variation of socialism has resulted in a similar outcome. Maybe not as much blood, but certainly poverty. Right now, we're living through an experiment in South America of socialism. There's a country in South America that used to be the richest country in Latin America. On a per capita basis, by far, the richest country in Latin America. It was a country, it is a country, that has more oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. It should be a rich country. It was a rich country. And yet, because of socialist policies over the last 20 years, it has become, today, the poorest country in Latin America. Babies are starving, dying of starvation. There are no pets in Caracas, no cats and dogs anywhere in Caracas, because they've eaten them all. The zoos were emptied, and the animals there eaten. Middle class kids like you are dumpster diving to find food. This is a country that has more oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. This is a country that has some of the most fertile land in Latin America. And yet, that land was collectivized 20 years ago, turned into collective farms, and is producing nothing today. And people are starving. Same result, same system, always happens. Now, Latin America is, the, Latin America is interesting because not far from Venezuela is another country. They used to be the poorest country in Latin America on a per capita basis. Also has some natural resources, nowhere near as rich as Venezuela. But over the last 20 years, has implemented economic policies that are the reverse of Venezuela. They privatized everything, or as much as they could. Not quite pure capitalism as I would like it, but you know, in that direction. And over the last 20 years, this country has become the richest country in Latin America. Shocking, isn't it? And that country is Chile, which adopted relatively free market policies and as a consequence done fantastically well from an economic perspective. Now, that shouldn't surprise us because the flip history of socialism is the history of capitalism. How many people were poor, you think? Like poor, like UN level poor, or the way the UN defines it, $3 a day or less. I don't know how many of you live on $3 a day. I assume nobody. $3 a day in today's dollar, or this guy does. So somebody give him, a, <laughs> give him a sandwich, he looks hungry. <laughs> how many people lived on $3 a day or less in the West 250 years ago? 
What percentage of the population? Anybody? How much? 50. Anybody want to challenge the 50? 90, much closer to 90, over 90%. Over 90% of people, 250 years ago, lived basically on less than $3 a day. They were subsistence farmers. They grew the food, they ate it. You know, some lived in the cities and were workmen. Life expectancy, anybody know what life expectancy was 250 years ago? Yeah, 39, something like that. I'd be dead, most of you are middle, middle age already, right? Yeah, it sucks. 39 life expectancy sucks, big time. But that's what life was. That's what life was. Not that long ago from an historical perspective. 250 years, not a long time. And yet, here we are, sitting in a beautiful auditorium, comfy. You guys are definitely considered young. Even I sometimes think I might be young, right? You might all live to be 100. Life expectancy if you stay away from opioids, is, is pretty sweet in the US. It's pretty long, right? And all of this has happened in 250 years. Nothing like this has ever happened in human history. Because that $3 a day when 90% lived, that was pretty much human history going all the way back 10,000 years. We basically didn't improve our living standard that much over 10,000 years, and then suddenly in 250 years, wham! It went through the roof. How did that happen? Well, sometime in the late 18th century, and the founding of America is an important part of this, people were granted, if you will, freedom. They were left alone. The state started protecting property rights, recognizing property rights, and leaving people alone to flourish. And people did. They went out and they did what they wanted to do, and they created businesses, some of them became entrepreneurs. They came in from the farms into the cities, and life was often rough and difficult. But you know what? Within 100 years, during the 19th century, life expectancy almost doubled. And then it increased even more the following 100 years. And the quality of life improved. Life became more comfortable, more easy. We worked fewer hours. We had more fun. How many people went on vacation 150 years ago? Nobody like maybe a few people at the top. There are no vacations 150 years ago. Today, wow, if you don't, like in Europe, if you don't get six weeks of vacation, you start a revolution. <laughs> but that's because we're rich. We're unthinkably rich in comparison to where we were 250 years ago. Nobody 250 years ago could imagine us being as rich as we are today. How did that happen? It happened because we had adopted to some extent, and to various extents, elements of capitalism, property rights, respect for individual rights. We let people live free. And what we got was incredible prosperity. And this country is representative of that prosperity. But this is true everywhere it's tried. One of my favorite examples is uh, is Hong Kong. How many, how many people have been to Hong Kong? Not many. I tell people, if you do one thing in life, you've got to go see Hong Kong once in your life. You've got to go see this place. Now, hopefully, it, it, it won't be destroyed um, by, by the Chinese takeover, but Hong Kong is amazing. It's a tiny little rock in the middle of nowhere. 75 years ago, it was a fishing village, which a relatively small population of a few thousand. Today, it has a population of seven and a half million people. They have more skyscrapers in Hong Kong than New York City. Their GDP per capita, adjusted for cost of living, is higher than GDP per capita in the US. They are richer than we are. They have no natural resources. They have nothing. Except what? Except economic freedom. 
They have a government that for 75 years did nothing but protect property rights. And people came from all over Asia to this little rock in the middle of nowhere because they wanted to be free. Because they wanted to be able to own something. They wanted to be able to build something for themselves. There was no safety net in Hong Kong. They didn't arrive and get free health care or a welfare check or free housing. All they got was the knowledge that their life and property would be protected. That whatever they built, whatever they created, whatever they owned, they got to keep. And as a consequence, the economy has gone through the roof and they are richer than we are. Capitalism works. Even when you try it just a little bit, like in China, when you just release the, 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 the entrepreneurial spirits just in a few areas in, in China, not even all over China, when you give them the semblance of private property, not even real private property, just a little bit, they feel like they've got private property. And people suddenly go out and they make and they produce and they build and they, they have energy and they become entrepreneurial. People tell the story of going to China in the 70s and seeing people shuffle around, not even walk, shuffle, all dressed the same in gray kind of uniforms, head down, looking down at, their, at the ground with no personality, no zest for life, nothing. Because life under socialism sucks. And you could see it in their faces. And today, if you go to China, oh my God, everybody's dressed different, everybody's yelling and shouting and moving and driving and running. Nobody, nobody walks in China, nobody sits in China because they're too busy living because they got a little bit of freedom. And unfortunately, it's only a little bit. One can only imagine how, China, how incredibly rich China could be if they actually liberated the place and actually turned it into a capitalist country. They could blow us away, blow themselves away. Right? And how successful, how rich, how prosperous they could be. So there is no, when it comes to economics, when it comes to standard of living, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to quality of life, when it comes to any material standard, there is no debate between socialism and capitalism. There is none. It's bogus. Capitalism works. Capitalism has been successful. Capitalism has created prosperity. Capitalism has extended human life. Capitalism has made life wonderful. And socialism is a disaster every single place it has tried. Now, I grew up in a socialist country. Not a communist country, in a socialist country. I've experienced socialism. I've experienced socialized medicine. I moved to America, right? Because <laughs> I wanted out. Your opportunities as an individual are suppressed. Your opportunities to get ahead, to succeed, to innovate, to prosper, to live are limited. And one of the saddest things for me is to see this country moving towards socialism, against history, against the facts. So the question has to be why? Why? Because it's not about economics, it's not about wealth, it's not about what succeeds and what doesn't from an economic perspective. There has to be something else going on. And a lot of socialists, including Karl Marx, admit to this. Karl Marx did not deny that capitalism produces the goods. Indeed, quite the opposite. Karl Marx said, yeah, it raises people into a middle class, it creates a middle class, it creates wealth, it creates success. That's not his objection to capitalism. And I don't think most socialists today are delusional enough to think that it is the path to prosperity. But for whatever reason, they believe that it is the path to morality, to virtue, to goodness. Now, 
in this context, what do we mean by virtue and morality? If the standard is human flourishing, if the standard is individual human well-being, the ability to make the most of your life, then the argument again is over. So there has to be some other standard that the socialists pine for, that they want, that they desire. So what makes socialism attractive? Why do we think it's cool? Because it turns out most American youth think socialism is cool. In spite of the blood, in spite of the disasters, in spite of the poverty, it's cool. Now, part of that is just plain ignorance. And I think a big part of it is just plain ignorance among young people. They just don't know the history. And it's incumbent on those of us who teach to teach the history and to teach it right. But I don't think it's just ignorance. There has to be something more. And I think this goes to the heart of what we perceive or what we take as ethics, as morality, as virtue, as the good. Because when we're, from when we're very young, we are taught that what virtue and morality and good means is not flourishing, it's not success, it's not happiness. It's what you do with other people. It's sacrifice. Sacrifice is noble, we tell everybody. That's standard stuff. And sacrifice, yeah, I mean giving stuff up and getting nothing in return. Now I'm very capitalist. It's about sacrifice. It's about being selfless. It's about living for other people. The moral code that we have ingrained in us, more so in Europe than here, but even in the United States, is a moral code that says that the group somehow, the group over there, is more important than the individual, more substantial than the individual. And the ideal for the group is that we all be what? Equal. The ideal for the group is equality. That we all be the same. That we all have the same. Not just equality of rights, not just equality before the law, but equality of outcome. That we all be equal. Now we know it didn't work under communism eh, because they didn't try it right. And we know it didn't work under Pol Pot in Cambodia they didn't get it right. We, this time we're going to get it right. Because the goal, the utopia, the ideal is still the right one. Equality. Now where this comes from is a long story, this idea that to be equal is somehow good. Because look around this room. I mean, I can see all of you, and let me tell you something. You're not equal. You're all different. Thank God for that. You're all different. You have different abilities, different skills, different characters. You look different. Different ages, different experiences. We're all different. And that is so cool. I mean, it would be awful to live in a world where everybody did this, was exactly the same. Even if everybody's like me, it would be terrible. <laughs> it would be terrible. And part of the reason we're so wealthy is because we're so different because we have a division of labor society where we specialize and where we can do what we have a comparative advantage doing it's that division of labor society that freedom to do what we enjoy what we have a passion to do what we have a comparative advantage to do which is what partially what makes us wealthy but replace all that with some ideal some ideal that says we must be equal. Why? Because. Because the metaphysical fact, the fact in reality is we're not equal. And to deny that is to deny reality, to deny existence. And the only way to make us equal is how? How do you make people equal? What's that? Hatchet, axe, and saw is pretty good. I mean, I think, I think the, the people who took that most seriously, the idea of equality, was probably Pol Pot in Cambodia. I don't know how many of you know the story. 
But uh, these were, these were well-educated people, educated in the Sorbonne in Paris, came back to Cambodia with the idea that they were going to create an equal society, but they confounded an unequal society. Some people lived in the cities and some people lived in the fields, in the countryside. So what did they do? How do you make those equal? You empty the cities. You drive everybody out of the cities. And as a consequence, some people starve. But that's OK, because the goal is equality. And we're, we're moving towards equality, and it's good. So some people starve. Sacrificing the individual to the collective, that's OK. We've said morality equals selflessness and sacrifice. So we're OK. And then they said, yeah, but even in the fields, even in the countryside, some people are more equal, some people are more able than others. Some people intelligent, more intelligent than other people. Some people maybe are educated and other people are not educated. Some people have a profession, a skill, some people don't. What do you do? What do you do? How do you create equality when people are so unequal? Well, you basically take anybody who has any kind of exceptional anything and you shoot them. And they did. If you had glasses, that was a sign that you could probably read and you probably went to school or something and you were shot. If you were a good forager of food, you were shot. If you could read, you were shot. And they killed 40% of their own population that way. And they killed all the intelligentsia. They killed everybody who had an education. And yeah, at the end of the day, they had a more equal society. It's called the Killing Fields of Cambodia. You can look it up. You can read about it. It's very morbid, very tragic. But that's what equality of outcome necessitates. There is no other way. Now, I'm going to make the claim, which I think should be kind of obvious at this point, that that's pretty immoral. Worse than that, that's evil. That's downright evil. And I would argue that the whole goal of trying to create equality of outcome from people who are unequal is an evil goal. It counter to nature, counter to reality, counter to human prosperity, existence, and well-being. It is an evil goal, which makes socialism an evil ideology. Not just in practice, but in theory, an evil ideology, because its goal, its mission, is to do something unnatural, to do something that necessitates the destruction of human life. And I don't know what you believe in ethics, but the destruction of human life is evil. So to finally get rid of this socialist tendency, I think what we need is to challenge to challenge these very deep beliefs about morality. Why is the well-being of the group more important than the well-being of the individual? Why is their happiness more important than my happiness? Why isn't the standard of morality my well-being rather than all of our well-being in some collective group? Why is equality a good thing? Where did that come from? And there is no answer to these why questions. To defend capitalism, to defend capitalism, which has led, again, life expectancy to prosperity, to well, human well-being across the board, everywhere it's tried. I think what we need is a new moral code. I think what we need is a new approach to morality, an approach to morality focused on the individual, focused on individual well-being. Focused on how to make my life and your life as individuals the best that they can be. I think equality as a goal needs to be scrapped completely. The only value equality has is political equality. We should all be equally free. What happens when you take a bunch of different people like in this room and put no constraints on them, leave them free? What do you think happens? Outcomes the same? Everybody turns out exactly the same? Now we're all going to produce different things. We're all going to make different stuff. And it's not just about money, right? Some of us will choose professions, like 
your professors here in the room choose professions where they're not going to make a lot of money. They're all smart. They could have gone into business. They could have gone to Wall Street, done something, made lots of money. But they chose to be teachers. Why? Because you know what? The fun of teaching, this, is more fun than money. It's not about money. It's about living. It's about enjoying life. It's about making the most of your life. That's what it should be about. So scrap equality. All we want is the freedom to live our lives as we see fit. And what we need is a morality that says that that's okay. And here I'm going to recommend, I know some of you have read Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, but I'm going to recommend that you read Ayn Rand. Because Ayn Rand actually presents a morality of self-interest, a morality that gives you the virtues and values necessary to live your life as you see fit. Live your life for you. Where the purpose of a morality is how to live life, how to live the best life that you can live. How to achieve happiness. That's a scientific question. How do you achieve happiness? Given that human beings have a particular nature, what do they need to do in order to be happy, in order to be successful versus to fail? Right? Morality should be about how to achieve happiness, how to achieve success, how to prosper in life, not monetarily, but holistically as a human being. It's only when we have a moral code like that that says it's okay to live your life for yourself. That capitalism can be defended morally and therefore can be accepted in a society. Socialism has failed. It's failed everywhere. Capitalism has been a success. If that, stand, that statement is true only if what we value is individual human life. That statement is true if what we value is the ability of the individual to prosper and succeed and live free and live well. But we don't value that. What we value is the group. What we value today more than ever is the tribe. We don't care about individuals. We have to sacrifice a few here and there. So be it. As long as the tribe is better off. That's what is driving us towards socialism. That's what's driving us towards statism. And that's the idea, this idea of tribalism, this idea of the, of the individual has to be scrapped. So I'm hoping that those of you who've been tempted by socialism take this opportunity to rethink it. And that those of you who are already kind of on the capitalist side, think about what it's going to take to defend this system. What it's going to take to protect our ability to prosper and succeed and be wealthy. And I think, my argument is, that we're going to have to discover a new moral code. We're going to have to discover a moral code of individualism and reject the morality of tribalism that exists and is prevalent today in the world. Thank you all. Thank you, Yaron, for a fabulous lecture. We've got lots of time now for Q&A. Um, so what I would like uh, first, please, is for people to actually ask questions. Uh, we're not interested in long five, 10 minute statements. We're here to uh, hear uh, Dr. Brooke. So my uh, strong request, please, is that you ask a short and to the point question. Uh, and we don't have microphones, which we typically do on the aisles. So what we're going to have, have you doing, one of the reasons why we need to ask short questions is for purposes of uh, the video recording, uh, Dr. Brooke will repeat the question. So please keep it short and to the point. It is our tradition at the Clemson Institute to take the first couple of questions from the students. So if there are students uh, in the audience who have questions, let's get your hand up. This gentleman right here in the front. Um, 
So the first is the whole blood thing of the 19th century when capitalism was born. I get it. Um, yeah, like the, the, the after economic crisis. The economic crisis, got it. Economic crisis, yeah. yeah. And um, basically, we're going to the war is going for the very highly chance. No mobility, mobility. got it. Yeah, like social yeah. 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 yeah, Okay, I'll take those three. All right. So. Um, the challenges are one, isn't capitalism full of bloodshed and uh, injustice, uh, taking people off their land and uh, forcing them into factories? And then uh, second is economic crises. And the third was? Social accountability. Social accountability. First I've heard of that. Mobility. mobility, social mobility. Mobility, yes. OK. Let's start with bloodshed. Um, oh my god. Um, I think it's one of, one of the greatest tragedies, I think, of modern education is that you don't learn what happened in the 19th century. You learn what Marxists want to believe happened in the 19th century, but not what actually happened in the 19th century. You don't learn that, again, 90 plus percent of humanity was dirt poor. They weren't forced off the farms. I'm not saying they weren't here and there some exceptions, but they weren't forced off the farms. What they did was left the farms for better opportunities in the city, just like is happening all over the world still. People are leaving the farms because the farms, anybody, what's life like on a farm? Wake up in the morning at sunrise, there's no electricity, you work all day, and you go to bed when the sun sets. And what do kids do in the farm? Everybody blames the 19th century as child labor. Oh my God, children worked. What did they do before the Industrial Revolution? They worked. From sunrise, to, well, actually, mostly they died. Because most kids didn't make it to 10. They died. So during the 19th century, they left this horrible lifestyle, and they went to the cities and got grubby jobs, what we would consider today grubby jobs, just like Chinese today are leaving the farms and going to work for Foxconn, right? In what we consider in, in, in the West, grubby jobs. For them, it's a path to middle classhood, but for us, it's grubby jobs. Their life expectancy increases dramatically. Their kids are not dying. Wealth is being created, so now parents can afford to send their kids to school. Parents can also now afford Cleanliness, which is part of why life expectancy increases, is, is we learn that, you know, where germs come from and we, and we have the wealth to be able to be clean. This is one of the 19th century. In context, is the most magnificent human century in history. It is a century where we go from poverty to wealth. It is a century in which we go from nobody gets an education, almost everybody gets an education. It's a century in which we go from living horrible, miserable, pathetic lives to the kind of the beginnings of the kind of lives we have today. And instead of studying that period and trying to understand exactly what happened and how it happened, we demonize it in the name of demonizing capitalism. But that is not the reality. The reality is not blood, certainly not anywhere close to the proportion of blood in socialism. Socialism is rivers of blood. Not to say everything that happened there is rosy and good and virtuous, but overall, the big picture is fantastic. If the standard is human life, if the standard is human prosperity, if the standard is your life and your kid's life, the 19th century is the pivotal century in all of human history that made what we have today possible. And it should be taught and studied like that rather than demonized 
in the name of ideology, which I think is what is happening. Crises. Now this is uh, another one of these mythologies. There is no crises under capitalism. Now, yeah, there, there's sometimes overinvestment happen and, and the correction happens, sure. But systemic crises, crises that impact the entire economy, great depressions, great recessions, are not phenomena of capitalism. They're phenomena of statism. The state is what has real systemic risk. Systemic means economy-wide risk. The Federal Reserve, when it makes a mistake, we all suffer. And it always makes a mistake by, by the very nature of the Federal Reserve. It is never quite right, right? Because it's a central planner, and central planners screw up all the time. So if you go back to the Great Depression and you study it properly, you realize that it wasn't a market phenomena. It was a phenomena created by the Federal Reserve's policies and by smoot Hawley government policy, and by everything else FDR did during the 1930s that sustained the Depression. The Depression is 100%, or as close to 100% as you can get, government-created phenomena. The Great Recession, I don't have time. I've given a six-hour course. It's online. You can take it on the causes of the Great Recession. Markets did not create the Great Recession. It happened in finance, and it happened in housing two of the most regulated industries in America. Banking is the most regulated industry in America. That's where the crisis happened. It's not surprising. And that's where systemic risk happens, because it affects everything, because the government's involved in it. When the dot-com bubble collapsed, which you could argue is somewhat maybe a market phenomenon, it didn't create systemic risk. One sector went down because it was overpriced. Big deal. But when banking went down, it was everything because it involved the government, it involved the Federal Reserve. Now, social mobility. Now, this is the funniest one, I have to admit, right? Because what other system has any social mobility? Any. Capitalism is the only system in human history that has allowed, that has made possible poor people to rise up. Before capitalism, you had feudalism, basically. You had aristocrats and peasants, and that's it. And the peasants could never become aristocrats. Suddenly, we freed it up, and we opened the floodgates. And poor people became middle class, and some people became rich. What was Rockefeller initially? Poor, nothing. He had nothing before he became the richest man in the world. Carnegie, most of those guys, they became, you could become middle class. Middle class people became rich, and indeed, if you go to Hong Kong, I mean, all these people who came to Hong Kong were dirt poor when they came to Hong Kong. They had nothing when they came to Hong Kong. Now they're middle class and rich, at least a big chunk of them, richer than we are. How did that happen if there's no mobility? If there's no mobility, they'd all still be poor. Hong Kong would be exactly the same as it was 70 years ago. People would have gone there and stayed poor. They came poor and stayed poor. All those immigrants who came to the United States in the 19th century would still be poor. Right? Your ancestors who came here with nothing. Now, maybe some of you, your ancestors came here with something. I can tell you my ancestors, they didn't come here, but wherever they went, came with nothing. They were poor Jews from little shtetls, farming communities in the middle of, you know, uh, Poland and Lithuania and Latvia. They knew nothing. They had nothing. And they went. And because of capitalism, they rose and they became middle class and some of them became very wealthy. Capitalism is the only system in human history with mobility. No other system in human history has allowed poor people to rise up from poverty. Allowed. It's not even allowed. You just leave people alone. And what happens is they produce and they create. So, yes, there's less mobility today in America than there was in the past. And that's sad. And that's horrible. And the reason is that we're not capitalist anymore. We're far from capitalists. The reason is regulations and controls and minimum wages and all the things that government imposes on us to keep poor people poor. Minimum wage being the primary of those, or one of the primaries. Minimum wage keeps pe poor people poor because it prices young people out of the job market. So they never get a job. 
which makes sure they always stay poor. Simple economics. So no, social mobility doesn't exist in any other system. Capitalism, when properly functioning, has a huge social mobility. It used, they used to say in the 19th century in New York, from short sleeve to short sleeve in two generations or three? Three generations, right? First generation was poor, made the money. Short sleeve is poor, represents poverty, right? Um, second generation lives off of that wealth. By third generation, they've lost it all. They're poor again. So you can go from poverty to wealth and back to poverty like that. And there are plenty of families to this day who've experienced that. That's real capitalism. Now today, we, because of regulations and controls and again, licensing laws and minimum wage laws and all these stuff, we reduce, have reduced mobility. That's tragic. But that is because we've moved away from capitalism, not because we moved towards it. All right, next question. Yeah, yeah I promise you. Uh, so earlier, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give, give you the hundred million. million. And in, that's 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 the, the highest. But uh, uh, in the past ten years alone, there's been seventy-five million deaths, uh, preventable deaths, of people living in capitalist countries. Uh, is is that a concern of the, the state, or are they just not working hard enough to prevent themselves from? from so that is a hundred percent made-up number. The capitalist state has killed nobody. People are not dying because of capitalism. There is no mass starvation because of capitalism. The only mass starvation is caused by socialism. There is no mass starvation because of capitalism. Uh, 75 million is a complete BS number made out of, comes out of nowhere. You can laugh all you want, but that is a fact. Um, socialism killed, killed, murdered more than 100 million people. <laughs> okay, case, uh, I'm, I, 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 you know, I rest my case. Oh, 75 million people died from hunger. Yes, absolutely. In places like Africa that doesn't have capitalism. In places like certain parts of Asia. What? Oh, that's right. I forgot. I forgot how, Af how rich Africa was before Colonel, you know, we all came there. There were these skyscrapers there. They were making semiconductors, and we stole it all from them. Give me a break. Africa was poor before. That doesn't justify anything the colonists did. The colonists, the, the, the colonists many of them were evil and exploitative and horrible and murderous. But the idea that there was a rich Africa, and, and we, somehow a royal we, we destroyed it, and now they're poor, is absurd, nutty, and an evil idea. Let's get it straight. The only, the only system that creates wealth in human history has been capitalism. When Africa, when Africa adopts, when Africa adopts capitalism, Africa will be wealthy. It's very simple. And indeed, countries within Africa that have become more capitalistic are becoming richer and becoming wealthier. Now, a single person in this audience came to hear you interrupt and be rude. So, you've had a chance to ask your question. We appreciate the question. Thank you very much. And we'll go on to the next question. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was talking about modern economics professor that capitalism is the absolute worst system except for all the other systems. So, I'm a recovery socialist. As we have, but how do you think we're going to reconcile? So I know there's, there's at least one economics professor in the, in the room right now. Uh, so so he, uh, the question was uh, I, that he was taught by his economics professor that capitalism is, is, uh, is the best system we have. It's not a good system, but it's just the best system we have. Well, that's tragic if that's what's being taught in economics. Capitalism is a great system. It's not just the best system we have. It is fabulous. Because what is capitalism? Capitalism is freedom. Capitalism is leaving people free 
to live their lives as they see fit. It is a system that says that all the government does is protect your property rights and leave you alone to produce or not as you see fit. And by the way, if you want to be a socialist under capitalism, you can do it. You can get your friends together. You can go set up a commune somewhere and to each according to his need from each according to his ability and live your pathetic, miserable lives in the commune. That's great. I mean, I've, nobody's going to stop you. That's the beauty of capitalism. It's freedom, right? As long as you don't coerce anybody, you can go live your socialist life under capitalism. But to your question about depletion of natural resources, how do we, uh, what do we do? We, we, we're massively consumption, right? And if Africa ever becomes capitalist, they'll start consuming. The Chinese are already consuming. Asia's consuming. We're all consuming. We're getting richer and richer, so we're consuming more and more and more. What happens to natural resources? Well, let me recommend a book to you. It's a, it's a fabulous book by an economist by the name of Julian Simon, who died about 10 years ago, called The Ultimate Resource. And in the book, Julian Simon articulates the case, which I support 100%, that there is no such thing as limited resources. That the only limited resource is the human mind. It's the imagination. It's our ability to, to figure out new solutions to problems. So I, I've been hearing about peak oil my entire life. We're running out of oil any day now. And Somebody uses their mind and figures out fracking, and suddenly there's no limit to the amount of oil in the foreseeable or unforeseeable future. But let's say we run out of oil. What is the resource at the heart? Is it oil? What's the real resource we're looking for? Energy. And then, so are there alternative energies? There's nuclear, maybe solar, maybe wind, maybe there are resources that we can't even imagine today. They are unlimited resources in the world, and that's even before we really get wild. But, but why not get wild, right? Why, why limit our imagination? What about mining asteroids? What about going to the moon and seeing what's under there? What about going to Mars? What about shipping resources to, 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 to Earth, right? Why not imagine and think big, right? There is no limit to human ingenuity, to human resourcefulness, and therefore there is no limit to natural resources. I am a, I'm a believer in human reason, in science, in our ability to create and make and, and, and innovate. And I think that every time, every time a resource gets expensive enough, entrepreneurs go and find alternatives for it. That's the history of certainly the last 250 years under capitalism, and there's no reason, and there's no, you have to, you lack imagination if you can't see that continuing forever. So I don't care how many people live on the planet, the more the better, from my perspective, because that means more minds, figuring out more solutions to more problems, and, and that's, that's fantastic. But we're probably gonna maximize it around 10 billion. I don't see any problem uh, in finding the resources to, 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 for whatever we need with those, with those 10 billion, and I'm not even counting then space exploration and everything else that is possible to human beings. I mean, one of the really sad things about your generation, I think, is that you brought, being brought up to not have big imaginations about the future. Because you, you're like the stagflation, you know, this stagnation uh, generation. You know, things are just okay. They're just growing slowly. We should think big. We should be, think boldly about what's possible in the future. Yes. And then I'll go to the back side. I hate to subvert the point you literally just made, Yeah. and you won't starve to death or get shot. But with certain emerging technologies like genetic modification, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, I worry that if we get it wrong, then it's just game over for humanity, the species goes extinct. So how do you see capitalism's acceptance of failure navigating us through this filter So, <laughs> I guess I worry less about that than you do, right? Um, <laughs> because I'm more optimistic about human nature, I'm more optimistic about what people, what is possible to, for individuals to do. Uh, I don't, I mean, I mean, again, the last hundred years, we have a tendency as human beings, and, and I, you know, we can speculate on where this comes from, but it's clearly a tendency to be a millennial, to, to believe 
that the end of the world is coming any day now. Any day now. It used to be millennial cults. It used to be all kinds of cults. And now it's technology, but it's been technology for a while. Uh, you know, we were going to starve to death. You know, uh, Paul Ehrlich told us that hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death in Europe in the 1970s. And then, you know, the seas are going to rise and they're going to flood us all and we're going to die. And that's after, of course, the global cooling of the 1970s. So there's always some story out there where we're all going to die. You know, and I'm, I'm skeptical. I think we're pretty resourceful people and we'll figure out ways around it. Now, the story about technology driving out all the jobs and us starving and things like that, Again, it's something I've heard over and over and over again, and it never comes to fruition. Uh, and again, I think it's because people underestimate the resourcefulness, and they underestimate the fact that our needs are infinite. What we want as human beings is infinite. Now, I don't know what the future is going to bring in terms of uh, robots and genetic engineering and, uh, and, I, and AI and artificial intelligence. But I think it's exciting. And I think it's fun. And I think you guys should be optimistic about it, not pessimistic. Because the pessimism will decay progress. And you should be bold about it. You know? We're gonna, I don't know what human beings are going to be like 200 years from now. You, know, you have to be a science fiction writer to find out. Are the chips going to be inside of us? Uh, 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 are we going to have companion robots? I don't know. But it's kind of exciting that we have the possibility of seeing that in the future. So I take it optimistically and positively in terms of what's possible in the future. And yeah, there are going to be risks. But if the risks are as big as you portray them, then there will be, they, they have to be ways in which to contain those risks, to contain the experiments, if you will. You, ever see, you see Planet of the Apes? Right? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the doomsday kind of, we play with a virus and it kills us all. Right? OK. Um, let's be careful when we play with viruses. And I think when people value their own lives and when people care about their own lives and their families and that's their focus and that's what they, they're really focused about and they're not doing it for the state and they're not doing it for the sake of some collective, then I think people are more careful, more cautious and more thoughtful about what they do and the science they do. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons were not created by individuals for their pleasure. They were created by the state in order to destroy other states, maybe justifiably given the war that was going on. But they were created by a state in order to, you know, for the sake of protecting a state. And, and when people are more focused about themselves, when we live in a place where states are not enemies of one another because each is just focused on protecting its own individuals inside that state, that's when I think you can progress in science without that danger. I think when the state gets involved in that science, that's when it becomes dangerous. And that's what socialism will bring us. So all that technology in the hands of socialists is a thousand times more dangerous than that technology in the hands of capitalists. Yes? So I'm not sure that I share your optimism about the future, especially regarding the automation of jobs. So there are a lot of estimates that put the figure around like 40% by the year 2030. Yeah. And let's just take that as the truth. So in that scenario, how do capitalist economic systems for the fact that not only are 40% of the population unemployed, but they're actually unemployed. Yeah, well, you don't take that, you don't, you don't accept that fact because it's not a fact. It's pure speculation by Luddites who have been making the same speculation for 250 years. If you go back and read journals in 1800, they say the same thing about manufacturing, about jobs in England being replaced by these sewing machine things that are replacing. So it's, and, and the same thing, I remember, I've got a, I've got a, a Marxist uncle, I've got, actually got two Marxist uncles. Um, and I remember visiting my Marxist uncle in London in 1986, right? No, in 1987, on the way to the United States. And he was so depressed, because he said, computers, they're destroying all the jobs. All the jobs are going to be gone within 10 years. 40% of the population is going to be unemployed, because computers are replacing everybody. I've heard this story so many times. And to me, when we were young, we never thought these kind of thoughts. And it's tragic to me to see young people thinking, worrying about the future. Don't worry about the future. Go live it. But now, this is where I, I go back to human needs are unlimited. We want, I can't imagine what we'll want in 20 years, 40 years. 
So let's, let me take some professions that 30 years ago I didn't imagine would exist today. Right? Or 40 years ago, 100 years ago, whatever. Right? You drive in California, I don't know about here in, uh, in South Carolina, but in California, every strip mall has a nail salon. There are literally thousands of nail salons within driving distance of my house. Right. Now, I don't know what they do in nail salons. My wife goes once in a while, but you know. But this is massive business. Let me tell you, 20 years ago, there wasn't a single nail salon within driving distance from my house. But there they are. Right. Um, restaurants. And you guys grew up with the phenomena of celebrity chefs. Chefs, people who cook, are now celebrities. That's bizarre. <laughs> it's just strange for our generation. That's strange, right? What's celebrity chef? How, how does that work? You may flip a hamburger. That's, that's food, right? But there's a massive industry today of chefs. And most of us don't eat at home anymore. Because why eat at home when we've got celebrity chefs who cook for us and make great meals? I love it. I love celebrity chefs. I'm a food, I become a foodie which is bizarre because I never thought I would be a foodie. But I traveled the world to go to celebrity chef restaurants. Like that, that didn't exist 10 years ago, certainly not 20 years ago. I don't know if we each will have a celebrity chef in our home every single day in 20 years when the robots take over because we'll be so wealthy that we'll be able to afford a celebrity chef in our home and a, and a masseuse and a, a personal manicurist and, and whatever, a pedicurist, right? I don't know. The point is that, again, go back to human ingenuity. What we imagine, what is possible to human beings, and what we want, and what we desire, and what we need, is infinite. And we're way too limiting our imaginations to imagine that robots can do everything, that AI will replace all jobs. I'm not worried at all. And I have kids your age. I worry about them, but not because of robots because they followed their passion like I told them to. Who figured that they actually listened to me on one thing? Um, and they're both in the arts. And that's a great example, by the way. How many people today do art? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about music, comedy, acting, all the stuff that entertains us. Like hundreds of thousands of people are in the arts. You go to LA, everybody's in the arts, right? Somehow they make a living, barely, but they make a living. How many people did arts 100 years ago? Nobody, or almost nobody, few people, right? Because you couldn't make a living at it. But we're so rich today, really, we're so rich. You guys are so rich. You have these, you have these supercomputers in your pockets where you can listen to music instantaneously. Pretty much every piece of music ever composed in the entire history of the world is on here. I mean, that's just stunning. It's stunning. And you take it for granted completely, right? So there are millions of people now making music so you can listen to on this thing who can actually make a living doing that. Not a great living, but a living, right? That didn't exist, again, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So I don't know what the jobs of the future are gonna be. I wish I did. I mean, I'd invest in them and make a fortune, right? <laughs> I don't know what they're gonna be, but I have real belief in, in, human, in the human mind, in human ingenuity, in human reason. Now, there's one caveat to that, that if we don't change our educational system, if we don't try, start training people to live and to actually do something productive with their lives, then you're right. Then maybe 40% of the people don't have jobs and we've got a real problem. But that's not a problem of capitalism. That's a problem of lousy education produced by guess who? By the state, by the government, government schools, which Clemson, I guess, is one of. But, um, but that, to me, is the problem. Not a problem of capitalism, but again, a problem of, of systemic risk where the government controls all the schools and therefore everybody gets, or almost everybody, particularly if you're poor, gets a really lousy education. That's the real tragedy. Not robots, bring them on. I can't wait to have my personal robot. I mean, that would be so cool. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, and then you. No, him, and then you, all right. Uh, you mentioned in your lecture that you came from a social state that had healthcare that was I guess, run by the state. Yeah. Uh, how would you approach the healthcare market and the system with regards to capitalism and socialism? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm consistent, <laughs> right? Uh, zero state involvement in healthcare. Zero. No Medicare, no Medicaid, no insurance regulation, 
nada. Let the market work. And what you'll see is beautiful stuff. Right? Um, I am a true believer in markets. They work. When you leave people free to innovate, produce, sell, and buy freely, then you get the best products possible. So if you left the insurance industry free of all the regulations and all constraints, they would produce products that would be suitable for you, whether you, you know, whatever your condition in life was. We would have insurance policies that insured us against pre-existing conditions. That is against one day in the future getting, you know, who knows what we'd have, right? But what we need is 100% privatization of healthcare, a complete privatization of healthcare, not tinkering with Obamacare and changing these exchanges to those exchanges. Get the government out of the way. I, I often ask audiences, what do you think this would, this is an iPhone, what do you think this would look like if a government committee designed it? Now everybody laughs. I, I can do this anywhere in the world, any age group, even among socialists. I ask them, what do you think this would look like if a government designed them, they laugh. Because they know it would look horrible and it would function horribly. Right? Even socialists know that. Okay, now this is not that important as compared to your health. So let's give government control of our health. They can't do iPhones, but health. Education. The two most important things in our entire lives, maybe, right? That we give to government. Right? Like you won't even use the post office if you can use FedEx or, or, or UPS, right? But drop your kids off at the post office every morning and let the government tinker with their brain, that's cool. Or go to a government hospital run by the post office, that's okay. I, you know, it, it, it really, you know, if markets are good enough for iPhones, they're good enough for my healthcare, they're good enough for education, they're good enough for pretty everything, because this, I'll tell you, this is gorgeous. And it functions brilliantly. And I want healthcare as good as this. I don't want to limit my, it goes back to imagination. I don't want my health care limited by some bureaucrat's imagination. And that's what we get today. That's what you have today. And I could go on and on about how rotten socialized medicine is and how destructive it is. It's destructive to the doctor and destructive to the patient and destructive to everybody. But I don't need to because you can experience it soon enough. Because <laughs> that's where we're heading. Yeah, I promised you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how does a 100% capitalist well, it provides a functioning military because that is the one function of, of, a, of a government uh, is to provide for military. So it, it, the one thing that the government should do, the one thing the government should raise revenues for is to provide for military. With regard to an ozone layer, I mean, my view is you let people know that if they continue pro using product X, they're all going to die. And in a free world, I think people stop using product X because there are lots of alternatives. I don't think it's that tough. I think this idea that we have to force people, that if we, and, and by the way, I think companies shift, right? Nobody has an interest in destroying, really destroying, not mythologically destroying, but really destroying the world, right? Because they live in the world and their kids live in the world and their friends live in the world. And if a company doesn't do it, we boycott them or we, or, we, or, you know, or we ignore them. So you don't need the state to come in with the guns and the rule of law to protect it. Now, if you can show me that a particular product really damages other people, if there's real harm, then you know, there's real harm. Then the government has a role to play. If you're spewing cyanide out of your you know, home and I'm breathing it and dying, yeah, the government's going to stop you and should stop you. So the role of government is to protect us from rights violations. And to the extent that your activity is doing real damage to me, the government has a role in stopping you. But I generally think a lot of these problems are solved voluntarily. I, I, again, I believe in human beings. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up that individuals choosing the businesses they want to be stopped on and stuff. And I, I've seen for example, carbon dioxide emissions. We know that carbon dioxide or fossil fuel companies have spent millions of dollars to try to influence public opinion. Now, you can argue over how much that is, but if you have a libertarian society, you need everyone to make 
mentioned the opioid epidemic. You said our life expectancy would be great, but the truth yeah. is for our life expectancy is declining. It's going down because of yeah. opioids. Yeah. And that didn't happen in Europe. We're in a country that prescribed 95% of hydrocodone because we don't have regulations that say drug companies can't market the doctors with their clients and say, this works, so, you know, this works for chronic pain. They have the same science we did in so how do you account for people not being in control? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't believe that the opiate epidemic has much to do with drug companies marketing to doctors. Um, and indeed, I'm glad that doctors in the United States feel free to, uh, to provide opioids to people with pain. And the socialized medicine, you suck it up. If you're in pain, you suck it up. Right, now, I've taken opioids because I've, I've had back surgery. That's why I'm wearing this brace. Um, and you take, you know, you get some morphine afterwards. And that's good. I'm really glad that I had that morphine when I was in real bad pain. The challenge is not to get addicted to it and to know what you're doing. And I, I think it's stunning to me that, yeah, there's structural problems in the system. And, and we can talk about where those structural problems are. It turns out that they're mainly in Medicaid. They're mainly in the socialized part of our system. And, and with the shift in Medicare, more people getting Medicare with Obamacare, the, the amount of sub, uh, prescriptions of opioids went up significantly. So there's some correlation there. But, but more than that, it's stunning to me that nobody actually uh, asks people to be a little responsible for their own lives. Opioids are addictive. What a shock. I mean, I've known that for, I don't know, 30 years. So when I get out of surgery, I take a few pills and I'm cautious to how I take them, right? And I don't, I make sure I don't get addicted to them, right? And I don't take huge quantities. And, and if I do get addicted, if I did get addicted, then, you know, seek treatment. Take responsibility for your own life. It's, it's, we're so used to, oh no, it's the system did it to me. No, live it, you know. But there are problems. I'm not saying there are no problems. But the problem of the opioids has to do with the fact that the FDA um, is constraining the ability of drug companies to create drugs that would be alternatives to opioids. Nobody is doing research in alternatives to opioids in terms of pain reduction because it doesn't pay to do such research because it's so damn expensive to get a drug approved by the FDA today. Kinds of, I mean, there are all kinds of issues about this. So what is the one that's fentanyl, fentanyl or something? That, fentanyl that's coming in from China. And there's all kinds of issues. But it's not drug companies are marketing the drug. That is not the cause. It's much more government policies and the way and, and personal responsibility and a bunch of other things that are going on in the FDA. And I warn drugs. I warn drugs as part of this problem uh, so that you know, people are afraid to seek treatment because they're afraid to admit that they're part of this. We've, we've, we've created this whole mentality around what it means to be a drug addict and so on. There's a, the, the array of issues around opioids is massive with this being the driver, right? And yet, all we can do instinctually is blame drug companies. And, and I think the same thing with CO2, right? I'm going to put aside the science because I'm not a scientist. I'm going to put aside the science of global warming. It cannot be the case, it cannot be the case that the solution for global warming, if it's happening, is to stop using carbon fuels. 
Because to stop using carbon fuels would mean death and destruction to millions of people, particularly in Africa. So that can be the solution. It just can be. So I'm willing to discuss other alternatives, right? And there's even a whole science now going into splinting something into the atmosphere to cool the earth down, which scares me. If we're not warming, then, then who knows what that'll do. But there's all kinds of issues we can discuss in terms of technology. Solar and wind will not substitute for oil and natural gas. It just doesn't work. It's fantasy, given the density of energy. Now, if environmentalists would come to me and say, you know what? What we want is a campaign for nuclear and hydroelectricity. Then at least I'd respect them in saying that they want a real alternative and they, they want to secure human life. But no, they want to stop carbon fuels, which means to me they don't respect human life. They, they want people to die. Now, what's the worst that will happen if the earth is warming? You know, Florida will flood. So they'll move. People will get up. And they'll buy a house in Canada, which will now become ha habitable. Brad can move back to Canada. <laughs> and they'll buy a house in Canada, and they'll move. It won't be the first time human beings have moved because of climate. We move. So Florida will flood. I mean, big deal. Right? I mean, it'd be sad for the people who actually live there, but it won't be a tragedy in historical proportion. What will be a tragedy in historical proportion if we stop using common fuels? That would be a real tragedy in, 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 in millions, hundreds of millions of people will die. So that can be the solution. So it's not drug companies marketing. It's just a fact of reality that without natural gas and, 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 uh, and oil, we would all die. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels by Alex Epstein. I highly recommend it. The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, not funded by the oil industry, although he wishes he could get some funding. Um, he, he does get some funding, but for that book, the book is a wonderful book, and it explains exactly this. Right? If there is a problem, let's solve it, but let's think about how we solve it without killing off half of the people in the planet. Yeah. Uh, do you think the government has a legitimacy of things like anti drugs and not just to make uh, barriers to entry? No. Um, and I don't think there are barriers to entry in a truly free market. So uh, take the worst case, so-called worst case in quotes, of a monopolist in, in, in US history, before antitrust laws. And that was in the 1870s, uh, Rockefeller Standard Oil. Uh, at some point, I think they had 92% of all the oil refining capacity in the US. And standard economic theory would suggest that uh, once they reach that, basically it's a monopoly, what would happen to prices? Who's taking Econ 101? They would go up. What would happen to quality? It would go down. Well, it turns out, if you actually go in the records and look, the exact opposite happened. Prices went down, quality went up. And you go, what, Rockefeller's an idiot? Why did he do this? And it turns out that Rockefeller understood that there are no barriers to entry in a true free market. That capital is always seeking a return. And if he drove prices up and quality went down, one, he would, competitors would arise. Two there would be fewer uses for the product he was producing. He was, he, was, he was refining oil. And the cheaper he made the pro refining process, the cheaper he made the product, the more uses there would be. Now guess who competed Rockefeller out of his initial business? What was the initial business that you used oil for? What did we use oil for or originally? Light. And uh, do you know who, uh, I, I don't know if you guys know, but Rockefeller saved the whales. Because before Rockefeller, what was used for light? Whale oil. The whaling industry basically was decimated by kerosene. Now, who competed Rockefeller out of the lighting business? Edison. Now, I want to find a bureaucrat who could have predicted that one. That's called substitution. It's a product that you couldn't, they're not on the same, like this is oil, this is black mucky stuff, and this is, ele this is electrons moving. And yet one substituted for the other. Substitution, you know. Now, it turned out that by that point, he'd made oil so cheap that he didn't really care losing the kerosene business. Because what did he move into? The gasoline business. And there was real competition of what would move cars. And gasoline won out because he had, by that point, made refining so efficient and cheap that 
you know, it was the obvious choice for, the, for, for, for an engine for an automobile, and he made his money that way. And by the way, by the time the antitrust people got around to breaking up Standard Oil, what percentage of the, of the industry did he own by that point? 20-something percent. So competition had already driven him down from 90 to 20 percent, and now they broke him up. So, no, if you look at the history, you look at Alcoa Aluminum, you look at IBM, you look at all the big antitrust cases, and what you find is prices were going down, quality was going up, you know, without the government going after these people, uh, it made no sense. And, you know, and, and the fact is that people have, I mean, I believe people have a right to collude. It's not the rights of consumers, it's property rights. If you want to get together with other business people and collude, you have a right to do it. It's not good economics. Almost always somebody cheats, something breaks up the, 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 the little scheme that you are doing. But you have every right to do it. You as a consumer do not have a right to get a product at whatever price you want. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry, we, we are now over time. Dr. Brooke uh, will, uh, will be happy to stick around for probably another 15 or 20 minutes or so for anyone who would like to ask him questions. Uh, let me just say that the Clemson Institute of the Study of Capitalism is proud to offer a safe space after this lecture. <laughs> a, a safe space with uh, soft music, videos of frolicking puppies, uh, coloring books and crayons for anybody who needs it. <laughs> we always do that when you're on, Brooke is here. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, for coming out. Uh, I think this has been a fabulous time. Uh, Yaron has, has given us, I think, a lot to think about. And uh, if nothing else, the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism is heavily invested in bringing new ideas to Clemson University and, and uh, hopefully instigating uh, a campus-wide conversation about important topics. So I'd like to thank you, but most of all, I'd like all of you to join me in thanking our guest speaker, Yaron Brooke.